Hello fellow camera nerds, it's James from Casual Photophile and F-Stop Cameras. We just released a new shirt in the F-Stop Camera shop which celebrates the Pentax 6.7, and it got me thinking about the time that I wrote an article about the Pentax 6.7 back in 2020. Now that article is a pretty good review of the Pentax 6.7, so I thought I would add it to the Casual Photophile TLDR show, which is a podcast and YouTube show where we sort of read to you articles from Casual Photophile so that you can enjoy them on your commute or when you're developing film or whatever the case might be. So if you love the Pentax 6.7, I hope you enjoyed this review and please check out the new shirt at fstopcameras.com. I will put a link to that in the show notes. Okay, enjoy the review. The first time that I used a Pentax 6.7 was in the winter of 2016. Contrary to the majority of my fellow professional camera likers, I found the Pentax 6.7 to be too big, too heavy, too manual, and too unreliable. Consequently, I hated it. I again tried to force myself to like the Pentax 6.7 in 2018, but again I found it unwieldy. It didn't help that this second time, the mirror locked up after every few shots, something which I learned was a common fault on Pentax 6.7 early models. So after two solid attempts to like it, the Pentax 6.7, it seemed, just wasn't the camera for me. And so it was with some reluctance that on a blustery day in early August of 2020, I decided to once again shoot the Pentax 6.7. I walked out my door with the incongruous wooden handle of the 6.7 twisting my wrist inexorably earthward, lowered myself onto the seat of my borderline geriatric BMW, twisted the key to awaken the reluctant burble of exhaust, and began the drive to the city. The distant sky to the north was dominated by clouds, gray and ominous. On the seat next to me sat the geometric metal bulk of the Pentax 6.7. At just under five pounds, the camera would be heavy enough to set off the passenger seatbelt warning chime of a more modern car, and the absence of alarm noise added itself to my long mental list of the joys of old vehicles. My mind wandered during the monotonous drive northward. Of particular dominance was the realization that this would be the first time I'd visited the city to shoot photos since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic more than five months earlier. I felt the creep of stress and sadness and stamped the accelerator. The car was too old to stream music from my iPhone, but if it could, Katsuhiro Hayashi's Outride a Crisis might have been appropriate. The Pentax 6.7 was loaded with an unusual film, expired in the year 2002 and gifted to me by my friend and fellow casual photophile writer Cheyenne Morrison, the role of Agfa Agfa Color Ultra 50 had reportedly been cold stored since new, and Cheyenne advised me to expose it as if it were still 2002. I believed him and took his advice, setting my light meter to 50 ISO, even if conditioned experience told me to expect imperfect or useless photos from this ancient expired film. Still, I mused, if I didn't like the uncertainty and the challenge, or should I say suffering, I'd not be shooting film cameras in 2020. In the seaport district of Boston, there's an enormous asphalt-covered pier known as the Fish Pier, which was first constructed in 1910. Running the length of the pier are a pair of identical low-slung buildings which house numerous fish-related businesses. That's quite the phrase, fish-related business. At the end of the pier, in pride of place, there's a stout building containing the New England Fish Exchange, which historically held fish auctions, but which now serves as a conference center. This is where I parked after my half-hour drive to the city, and it's where I shot the first photos in my most recent attempt to fall in love with, or to appreciate, or to understand, or to respect, or maybe even just to tolerate the Pentax 6.7. But before we get too much further, let's answer the question, what is the Pentax 6.7? Loved by many and recognized on site by most photo geeks today, the Pentax 6.7 is a legendary camera. But if you're new or have simply missed the crest of the 6.7 popularity wave, these few brief paragraphs will bring you up to speed. The Pentax 6.7 is a single lens reflex medium format film camera first introduced in 1969 and produced in four iterations until it was discontinued in, are you ready for this date? 2009. Wow. The Pentax 6.7, like many smaller professional spec SLRs for 35mm film, is a system camera which features a body to which lenses, prisms, and accessories can be interchanged by the user. The typical Pentax 6.7 kit features a standard lens, around 105mm, 
A viewing prism, which could be an eye level, waist level, or metering head prism, and a big honkin' wooden handle, which can be removed or placed on either side of the body. The camera uses 120 film and exposes images on a 6 by 7 centimeter area, hence the name. The camera was able to use 220 film in the past as well, though this feature is now moot as 220 film is no longer manufactured. There are four models in the Pentax 67 range. The first is identified by the 6x7 marking on its right hand side, written as 6x7, and this was made from 1969. It was superseded by the second version in 1976. This improved model is also marked 6x7. It featured a mirror lockup function, and this is the easiest way to identify it by the sliding switch on the right hand side just behind the lens mount, which locks the mirror up prior to firing the shutter, thus eliminating mirror slap vibration for low light and long exposure shooting. The third version of the Pentax 67 was introduced in 1989. Though virtually unchanged in specification from the previous model, it does show minor cosmetic updates, including new branding. As opposed to the earlier 6X7, this third version is marked simply 67. The third version of the Pentax 67 is compatible with all previous model accessories, lenses, and prisms. The greatest improvement in the third version, besides some reliability fixes which we will touch upon later in the article, was the improved metering prism, which swapped the old CDS cell for the more responsive silicone photodiode. Metering range between all three versions remained identical. The fourth and final iteration, the Pentax 672, was released in 1998, and it is easily the most capable of the bunch. Major improvements include a rigid right-hand grip to supplement the optional left-hand grip of earlier models, inclusion of a modern Pentax 5P flash connector, improved long exposure capability, and an LCD panel to display ISO, film frames, battery status, shutter status, and flash status. The 672 also brought other minor improvements to the range, including a self-timer and a multiple exposure mode. But beyond all of these improvements, the greatest functional improvement which the 672 brought is certainly the AE Finder, which allows us to shoot in aperture priority semi-auto exposure mode. This advanced finder also allows three metering modes, center-weighted, spot, and multi-segment metering. In addition, the AE Finder displays pertinent info such as shutter speed, aperture, metering mode, exposure compensation setting, and flash status, as well as displaying all of this information via LEDs as opposed to the earlier camera's needle system. The Pentax 672's AE Finder is not compatible with earlier Pentax 67 models, and the 672 is not backward compatible with metering prisms from earlier cameras. Now, all four of these models have reliability issues. As touched upon, I've owned and tried to love quite a few Pentax 6.7s, and most of them have needed repair. Mirror lockup issues, film transport issues, battery drain issues, the Pentax 6.7 has given me fits every time I've used it. Because of this, the 6.7 has been a camera which, for years, I've struggled to recommend to would-be photographers. These reliability issues are also a big part of why this review has taken me four years to put together. Bearing all this in mind, and in preparation for this article, I reached out to Eric Hendrickson, who is arguably the foremost authority on Pentax camera repairs in the United States. He's been servicing Pentax equipment since 1969, incidentally the same year that the 6.7 debuted, first as an employee of Honeywell Inc., and then Asahi Optical Co., and finally with Pentax Corporation. After this, he opened his own repair shop, which operated from 1992 until 2005. Now, he works a one-man shop, servicing Pentax cameras for clients all over the world. Since there really is no substitute for hands-on experience, I asked Eric for his opinion on the reliability of the various Pentax 6.7 models, and he was kind enough to provide direct information broken down by model type, which I present here just as Eric sent it. He first talks about the non-mirror lockup 6x7. This would be that first model that we talked about. About the non-mirror lockup 6x7, Eric says, quote, First, let me outline the non-mirror lockup units. These units are getting old, a lot of people are using them, and a lot are being sold from Japan. These first 6 sevens are almost considered prototype. They were the first ones off of the assembly line, and now they're developing a variety of problems. As a technician, they are becoming a nightmare to repair. Every unit needs updating or modifying to bring them back to good working order. I usually refuse to work on them, or will charge $500 plus parts. The major problems in these models range from film not being pulled through the camera due to a bad winding clutch, 
the mirror locking up, transport locking up, and the shutter not charging for the next shot. There are several ways to identify these units, presumably Eric means so that buyers today can avoid buying the troublesome first model. The obvious one is the missing switch for the mirror lockup, which later models have. Then inside the back there is a rubber roller where the improved models have a steel roller. The lens release tab is silver, as is the battery holder, and the knurled thumb film release is at the bottom, instead of a flipper lever. Eric then describes reliability issues for the mirror lockup units. These would be the second and third versions we talked about. The mirror lockup units are the ones to look for, and the more modern ones have their serial number in black and engraved on the top cover. Of course, there's also the mirror lockup switch to identify them. I've had excellent success repairing these units. I can still get parts for them, and they hold up over years of use if handled with care. In good condition, barring sand, water, or impact damage, the cost of repair ranges from $250 to $350 plus parts. The units marked 67, as opposed to the 6X7, are the most current of the original 67. The number one problem with these is battery drain. What happens is the battery holder tension spring inside the holder is too tight on the battery and can disconnect from one contact or the other. The next most common problem is the clutch. Here, I believe, but can't prove, that the customer, instead of releasing the film by the tab, just pulls the film from the spool, causing the clutch to wind backwards, which damages the film clutch. Eric also talked a little bit about the through-the-lens metering units. This would be the prism that fits to the top of the camera. Most TTL units can be repaired, he says. They either need foam bumpers, or the viewfinder system inside breaks away, making it impossible to see the meter. Also, the chain for the metering system connection in the body can snap easily. This is caused by the customer removing the finder first before removing the lens. Removing the lens first will loosen the tension and prevent the chain from snapping. Now this is all really great information, and if you'd like to talk to Eric about repairing your Pentax 67 or for other camera-related repair inquiries, please contact him via his website. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. But let's get back to talking about my experience shooting the Pentax 67 in the real world. If you'll remember, we had just arrived in the city on a somewhat dreary day. As I walked the pier toward the fish exchange building, the sounds of seagulls and the rhythmic clank of boat parts providing a decidedly maritime soundtrack, two thoughts were continually chasing one another in my mind. Damn, those fish smell terrible. And damn, this camera is heavy. Now I can already hear fans of the Pentax 67 taking offense, asking if I even lift. Well yeah, I do exercise, and the Pentax 67 is still too heavy. The foam padded neck strap, which kept the camera on my person in a cross-body configuration, had caused muscle pain in my shoulder and back and neck within 20 minutes of walking the streets of Boston. Holding the camera in my hand helped ease the pain, but within another 15 minutes I found myself moving the 67 to my left hand, and then my right hand, and then back around my neck, and then onto the ground while I rested for a minute. There's just no way to escape it. The Pentax 67 is just heavy. And it's not just heavy, it's also big. The Pentax 67 isn't just large, it's comically large. It's like a camera version of that giant cell phone prop from Trigger Happy TV. Some of you will be too young to understand this reference, so here's a clip. Hello! No! I'm on a boat in Holland! In Holland! No, it's rubbish! There's lots of cheese and stuff! Yeah, I can't talk! Yes! Yeah, okay, see you! Ciao! The 6.7's mimicry of the standard 35mm SLR design makes its sheer enormity even funnier. It's nothing more than a blown-up Pentax Spotmatic, and there's something about that which makes me laugh, but it also makes me cringe. Like the conspicuous giant cell phone in that reference sketch comedy show, the Pentax 6.7 gets way too much attention. There's no way to use this camera surreptitiously, and even if we're not necessarily using the 6.7 as a street photography camera, its visibility still impacts photos. Landscapes in the city were plagued by wide-eyed passersby staring blankly into the lens. It doesn't necessarily ruin a shot, but it certainly breaks the fourth wall. Mirror slap, in keeping with the theme, is thunderous. Releasing the shutter of the Pentax 67 is sure to elicit a few glances from the folk around you. When I use it to take pictures of my kids, they actually flinch. When I brought the camera out to shoot some family photos at Christmas time, my in-laws laughed at it. They said, are you sure that camera's big enough, Jim? 
That giant wooden handle that everybody seems to love? I think it's silly. Okay, it looks interesting in an agricultural way, like the wooden parts of an AK-47, but I don't like AK-47s, and other camera companies have shown that there were plenty of ways to stabilize a big camera without slapping a big wooden handle onto it. And yes, that handle can be removed, but doing so transforms the hard-to-handle Pentax 6.7 into the impossible-to-handle Pentax 6.7. It's hard to argue that the size and weight is a requirement for making 6 by 7 centimeter images. The Pentax 6.7's image area only gains us a centimeter over many smaller, lighter, and more elegant cameras. Hasselblads only weigh 3.4 pounds with a lens attached, and the Rolleiflex SLR cameras only weigh 4.4 pounds, and these cameras only lose 1 centimeter on one axis compared to the enormous Pentax 6.7. Fujifilm's medium format rangefinders weigh about the same or less than the Pentax 6.7, and we can get a 6x9 image out of those. Going back even further in time, Zeiss Icon's classic folding 6x9 cameras are pocket-sized by comparison. I used one of these for a full day at Disney World without any inconvenience. And to be honest, the Pentax 6.7 doesn't make better or more interesting images than a full-frame digital camera if we know how to edit RAW files in a way that evokes the essences of Portra, Ektar, 400H, and all the rest of the films that everybody loves. Film certainly has a unique look, but you can get that look with digital. The reason I shoot film cameras is because I like the cameras, and I don't really like the Pentax 6.7. There are a bunch of other little problems, like the shutter speed being limited to just one one-thousandth of a second, which is fine, but it won't be fast enough for some of the images that certain people want to make. The metering prisms are fine, and they make focusing relatively easy, but none of them offer full image area coverage, and the focus throw of almost every lens on the system is extremely long, so having a nicely focusing viewfinder doesn't really speed up the process. The best version of the 6.7 is the 6.7.2 and its auto exposure prism, but to get that we have to spend a lot of money. The shutter on any of the 6.7s won't fire without film being loaded or without doing some finger gymnastics with the open film door and the film frame counter. Loading it is fiddly until the 20th time we've done it, and it's an expensive camera to use because medium format film is expensive. So yeah, I guess I just have a hard time seeing the obvious benefit of the Pentax 6.7. About an hour into my day shooting the camera, the ominous gray clouds which had loomed on my drive northward finally decided to burst. The first time that I'd gone out to shoot photos in five months, and there I was, getting soaked, sitting atop slick granite blocks perched above the lapping froth of a gray and black Boston Harbor. I shot through the rest of the roll, my glasses fogged by the unseasonable cold, and my own breath directed inconveniently by the mask covering my mouth and nose. I finished exposing the expired Agfa Agfa color, and flinging the anchor of a camera onto my least achy shoulder, I began the twenty-minute walk back to the car. I'd shoot the Fuji Neopan film that I'd also brought some other time. It was, by the standards of earlier days, a failure of a photo trip. But this was 2020. If it sounds like I hate the Pentax 6.7, that's not quite true. I don't really hate it. I find it slow to use, hard to hold a bit clumsy, and kind of ridiculous, and I have other medium format cameras which I choose to use every time over the Pentax 6.7, but my not getting along with the Pentax 6.7 has just as much to do with the way that I engage with photography as it does with the camera itself. I take pictures while out and about, I take pictures of my family and kids when we're doing activities, I walk around and look for interesting light, and I like to stay out for a long period of time when I get the chance to shoot. The Pentax 6.7's weight and size make it a poor choice for any of these types of photography. Now, if I were a studio shooter, or someone making photos of models with controlled light in a controlled environment, where a tripod is always handy, the Pentax 6.7 would make a lot more sense. If I were a dedicated landscape shooter, it might fit better as well. A friend of mine uses his 6.7 in these ways and makes beautiful photos with it effortlessly, but I'm just not that photographer. All of these negatives noted, there is admittedly one area in which the 6.7 is truly phenomenal, and possibly unbeaten by other medium format camera systems. In this area, it's the best camera that I've owned, and it's the one factor that comes closest to changing the way I feel about the Pentax 6.7. I'm of course talking about the 6.7's lenses. The Pentax 6.7's lenses are simply fantastic in every way. Every single lens that I've used for the system produces stunning results. 
They're smooth to focus, if not extremely long to focus, impeccably built, finished beautifully, and the SMC coatings do their job amazingly. Their optical performance is second to none. I truly love the lenses that I've used with the Pentax 6.7. And there are quite a few lenses available, from an extreme wide angle of 35mm up to an astounding 1000mm. There are fisheye lenses, a spherical element lenses, ED lenses, macro lenses, and zoom lenses. The Pentax 6.7 lens system is one of the only medium format camera systems which can truly go head to head with pro spec 35mm systems. So if glass is the ultimate measure of whether or not a camera is good, and for a lot of people that is the ultimate measure, the Pentax 6.7 is certainly very good. It's possibly even ideal, even if it's less than ideal for me in plenty of other ways. So my final thoughts on the Pentax 6.7, it's a very good system camera, it's just not my kind of camera. I prefer small cameras, I prefer semi-auto exposure and exposure compensation, and only the 672 offers that, and I'm not rich. I can't afford to shoot the volume of images I want to make on 120 film, so I'm kind of just not a big 120 film guy. I'm also frail and pathetic, apparently, and my neck hurts from using the 67 in the way that I use cameras. It's just too damn big for me. That said, I do genuinely enjoy a lot of the images that I've made with the Pentax 6.7 over the years, and I personally know plenty of photographers who make amazing work with their Pentax 6.7s. Maybe I'm just not there yet. Maybe another couple of years of shooting the 6.7 will convert me into a fan. Maybe a few more years of weightlifting will help. If those things happen, and if my relationship with this camera changes at any time in the future, I'll be sure to let you all know. Many thanks for listening to this reading of my Pentax 6.7 review. Like I said, if you enjoyed the Pentax 6.7, I hope you enjoyed this article, and I hope you'll check out the new shirt that we released celebrating the Pentax 6.7 in the shop at fstopcameras.com. Once again, the links to that will be in the show notes. You'll also find links to the Casual Photophile socials and links to my social channels as well. If you did enjoy this, please like the video and subscribe so that you don't miss the next one. I hope you have a great day, happy shooting out there, and we will catch you in the next one.